Memorial Day is a day unlike any other. Since 1868, we've come together in our communities and churches to place flowers and flags on the graves of those who have given their last full measure of devotion to our country. And we've come here today to remember and honor those who have done their duty as God allowed them to know that duty. But what I'd like to do before we get particular about Memorial Day in America is to zoom way back and see the ultimate big picture. And this will be relevant as we get to those particulars. <clears throat> this map of the world has three lines on it that I'd like to call your attention to. The red line represents Mount Zion and Jesus and where he came to sacrifice for mankind. The blue line goes right through Greenwich Mean Time, where we start and end every 24-hour day by our clocks today. It represents time, as time passes and as we know it. And the white line goes right through the heartland of America, where God has created a special place and a special people. And I know that some internationalists or globalists would not care to have that white line go right through America, but history shows that it is true that that line should be there. And we'll talk more about that as time goes by. I've taken all three lines and put them together on the red, white, and blue of America. Because America is that place where God's eternal purpose has coalesced in the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th centuries and now going in to, to the 21st century. And why do I say that? Because I believe that the Bible shows and history shows us that this nation was created specifically for a purpose to develop a people of God. As Peter says, a peculiar people. That with the Holy Bible and with the nurturing and strength that our forefathers have always had and have always given, we're to go to the rest of the world to be that beacon of hope for freedom that you see nowhere else any better than this country. And what is all that for? That is for eventually the Christian flag to be honored above all others within the kingdom of God that Jesus Christ will come one day to plant his feet on Mount Zion and will reign from there for a thousand years under the Christian flag that we honor in this church as well as the American flag. And so this is the big picture, brothers and sisters, that we need to look to to understand our part in that kingdom operation. God's eternal purpose for the Christian era that we are within right now. But within that, let me cite a few facts because facts have a, a way of not allowing you to ignore them. In America's fight for freedom during 80 months of Revolutionary War, 
there were 4,435 deaths and 10,623 casualties. And per capita, that was a very expensive war in terms of blood. In the Great Civil War, there were approximately 700,000 combined deaths. I know the official toll has been seen at 619,000 or 620,000, but just in the last decade, historians have gone back and they've used modern methods <laughs> to figure out that there were at least 700,000 deaths on both sides during the Civil War. Freedom for all was in the balance and both the slave and the states learned great lessons and finally came away with something that grew, nurtured by the blood of brothers. During the Spanish-American War, there were 2,246 men who died on foreign shores. In World War I, there were 116,516 American servicemen who died. World War II was by far the most, the largest national effort in which we lost men and women. 407,316 men and women died in the line of duty. That's 6,639 people each month of the war. In 48 months of war. In 37 months of the Korean War, we lost 33,651, or about 909 Americans dying in combat each month of the war. In 90 months of the Vietnam War, we lost 47,369, or about 526 Americans dying in combat each month of the war. Doesn't that seem incredible? But it happened. In one month of the Gulf War, which is all it lasted, praise God, we lost 293 to death and 760 casualties. In the Iraq conflict, the death count of American military men and women was 4,486. And in Afghanistan, we lost 2,568 of our finest. Not to mention the wounded. That count rose into the thousands. These Americans who died in all of our wars did their duty as they saw fit and we know who they are because we can visit their graves and see the shortened dates of their young lives. We know of their loved ones, their mothers, their wives and children, and the friends who always missed them but realized their death had meaning. They left a legacy of freedom. They taught their children and their children's children the value of sacrifice. They taught us the love of country. These hallowed souls have become our teachers of the things for which we stand and of the courage that is necessary to maintain those things. They taught us what it means to be a citizen of the last best hope of earth that God has created a great benevolence to mankind through America. <clears throat> Knowing how tough we are in war and how energetic and creative, how organized and today how full of technological wizardry, how hard driving and relentless in our pursuit of victory, you would imagine that our enemies would think twice before loosing the dogs of war 
it appears they're suicidal. What we know is that they are determined to destroy. One sage, upon looking at the destruction of the Nazis during the Second World War, commented that a spoiled child can destroy a radio with a hammer. Only a mature adult can build a radio. The spoiled children of evil must be deprived of their hammers. This is a biblical concept. The Old Testament is replete with references to the battle between good and evil. Our New Testament encourages us to stand our ground for righteousness. Indeed, Paul tells us in Romans 13, 1 through 5, to submit to government authorities as they have been allowed to be in control of society for a time. That verse says, He, the governor, is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. With this in mind, our forefathers responded to the call for arms. Now let me express within this time that we have that Christians would rather die than send a soul to hell that might one day be accepting of the gospel of Christ and be allowed into that eternal home. We do not wish anyone's early death, but if he or she is determined for evil purpose to destroy God's people and his ultimate plan, we must accommodate him. But what other country in the history of mankind is so beneficial to our conquering after conquering our enemies. Like the generous people we are, we helped rebuild their countries, we wrote constitutions for the defeated and insisted that their regimes turn toward democracy and rights. Instead of enslaving the defeated, we set them free. At our finest hour, Americans treat the vanquished with magnanimity. It's no wonder that the 20th century has come to be called the American century. 1 Peter 2.9 says that we are a special people, a peculiar people, it says in the King James Version. Among other things, this means that we have a duty to God. We die that we can live. We give in order to keep. Have we not heard these things from our Savior's lips? How is it not possible to honor such men and women that we honor today that died so that we can live and so that they could live? Most importantly for our future, our question should be, how do ordinary women and men become brave enough to face down America's enemies? I believe that the answer lies within. They reach deep down into their hearts with a common heritage. Americans have always sought to be loyal to families, communities, their home states, and an America that gave them the bounty of life in a free country. A country whose schools taught that this land was a gift from God. Those same teachers passed along the truth that there is something worse than death. Living as a selfish parasite in a land that has given so much that is beautiful and meaningful under heaven. Our honored dead reached down into hearts that yearned for meaning. The meaning of fighting for something bigger than themselves and their creature comforts. Something that they could be proud to have been a part of. A band of brothers and sisters in the right as God has given us the ability to know it. I truly believe that God destined us and has wired us for meaning. Meaning that finds rest only 
in his kingdom service. Now there are going to be people who will say, but wait, war is horrible. War is against the Christian creed. It's against the Christian spirit. Well, I want to make a small case for what we believe as conservative Christians is called the just war. Of course, we all have the motto, semper fidelis, always faithful. On the one hand, war is evil, but on the other, war is, or at least some wars, can produce some degree of good by maintaining peace, establishing justice, and protecting the lives of innocent people. Arthur Holmes, one of our great philosophers said there is a principle of justice. Love does not supersede the law of justice. The teachings of Jesus actually capture the true spirit and intention of the law, namely justice tempered by love. Love not only goes the extra mile, but also demands the protection of the innocent. Moreover, owing to man's fallen state, not all evil can be avoided. And so we have the, the concept of the just war. Now on one hand, one extreme, you have pure pacifism. And a lot of people today are on this side. They are pure pacifists. But in this fallen world, that pacifism breaks down under the microscope. Others on the other side say it's my country right or wrong no matter what happens, no matter what the leaders decide we are going to follow them and we are going to take out any enemy that our leaders say we should take out. Well we as Christians fall in the middle under the just war. And so let's talk about that for just a moment. The just war has four priorities. The ultimate purpose is peace. War is seen as the last resort. Either national defense and clear and present danger must be shown to be true. Number three, violence will be limited to those in arms. And number four, use of minimum force will be conducted as needed for victory. Those are important distinctions and should be considered by all thoughtful Americans. And that is what has been considered by our forefathers and by our American heritage. These four things make a just war that Christians in a fallen world can follow. I want to ask you to go back with me to the Old Testament for just a moment. In Exodus 34, 6 and 7, you'll recall that Moses asked God, what is he like? Show me what God is like so that I may Give that definition to the people. And the Lord came by him as he was in the cleft of the rock and said, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation. Now as God comes to Moses and gives him this definition, he says, I want to be primarily and am a God of 100% love toward mankind. But I'm also a God of 100% justice because that is 
the true truth for mankind and the world that I've created. And even Jesus in Matthew has said when the Pharisees in their sin came up against him, he said, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will fog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I would call that righteous indignation against those who come up against the innocent and against those who are speaking and living for truth in this world. In Romans 13, Paul says, for he, the ruler, is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. And so we, as we live in a constitutional republic, are under the rulers who have been elected and appointed in our republic by us as a majority of Americans and those rulers God has allowed for a time to be in charge and to bring up armies that will stand in defense of freedom. 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14 says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as to the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. So there we have Peter and Paul saying that Christians, they're talking to Christians, sub should submit themselves to those who are in charge that God has made them those that are instituted for a time by him. So, fighters for freedom have always had this kind of frame of reference when going into battle. Yes, there's pressure to be known as brave and not to be known for the rest of your life as a coward because you ran from the enemy. And sure, there's a sense of loyalty that bands of brothers have as they go into battle to, to look out for one another, to support one another rather than not fight the enemy. But I want to give you a deeper meaning for going into battle against an enemy that a Christian that who is American can be able to understand. The mental strength to keep the warrior can be well illustrated by imagining a picture in a picture frame. The picture can only be seen because of the frame it hangs within. Our national frame has four sides. These sides were given to us on our birth certificate, the Declaration of Independence. In the beginning, the framers of the Declaration tell us, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their Creator with inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the cons consent of the governed. If we believe this statement, we must take up arms if any enemy power proves his intent to take these things away. First, the framers 
of our declaration and our constitution set truth as the top side of the frame and God's intent as the bottom of the frame. For over 400 years, this moral absolute of truth is what our forefathers have believed. The truth of God creating mankind for his purposes. So these two truths and truths and God's intent are the top and the bottom of our national frame. Of course, American society today is filled with vacuous voices of moral relativity. They say there can be only your truth and my truth. No, our father said, there's only one truth. True truth from God. And so they say there is no God. This way they can follow their truth to where it leads. Freedom to be God in themselves. But with no top and bottom to the frame, you can see how the picture of freedom falls. This potent paragraph from the signers of the Declaration also has sides to the frame. Certain rights is on one side. This truth is based on the Bible and it implies that we have been providentially chosen to have and give this abundant gift of potential to the rest of the world. Life, liberty, and the right to pursue happiness equally. No government alone can give this. If government gives it, government can take it away. But God gives it inalienably, which means it's untakeable without a fight. Finally, the frame has a fourth side. It's only complete with the last clause in that great sentence. Consent of the governed. This tells us that we all get a say because governments exist through the consent of us. If that consent is threatened by bullying, fear-mongering, or government officials cheating, we must take up arms. It's our duty under God. These four realities of the frame frame our way of life, our freedom under God. Truths, God's intent, certain rights, and our consent. Read it again with that in mind. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government governed. That's why we continue to honor those who gave their life. They fought all enemies, foreign and domestic, because the alternative is to cease to be under God and to cease to have a free country. The deep down meaning for the Revolutionary War soldier, sailor, and marine gathered around a Christian God that their pilgrim fathers and pioneer mothers instilled through hundreds of Bible verses of salvific sacrifice for freedom under God's providential hand. For the Civil War dead, the battle cry was, His truth is marching on. And no matter which American side, Bibles were found in pockets and haversacks of those who fought. The deep fountains of meaning burst forth in the hearts of world war fighters. They marched forth, sailed far, and fought hard 
Under the banner of America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crowned thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. The young stalwarts who died in the Korean campaign and in Vietnam gave the last measure of devotion to stop Asian aggression. For liberty of those that in most cases they did not know but also for those in following generations of Americans that they knew would be blessed by them answering the call. After all, where does one stop evil and aggression? Do the deep sacrificial hopes of freedom wait for the minions of Satan to arrive at their shores and spill the blood of their own children? No. For their fellow Americans and for the cause of freedom, they lived out the words of that great anthem. And I'll stand up next to you and defend her still today. Because there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. That sense of sacrifice is for a country that's always given life meaning through freedom. And that freedom was and is the direct result of Christianity on these shores, the hope of glory stated in hundreds of scriptures and believed by millions of Americans from 1776 until the end of the 20th century. But what about today? The third decade of the 21st century. Will the next conflict see American soldiers running from the enemy? rather than risk death for God and country? Worse, will they actually turn on their own as it was in Nazi Germany? God forbid that we who have received so much from so many under God will neglect to remind our youth that they protest only. They only have the best the world has to offer they only raise their fists in anger because they stand in a nation that allows them the freedom to do so. Here is where we will find the fruit of the new fight between good and evil. I propose to you that it all hinges on one question answered properly only by our faith. Perhaps the greatest question we should ask ourselves about the faith of our fathers and mothers, about the death of our society's best hearts, is what happens when we die? What deep meaning could there be in putting one's life on the line for others? The answer is that it holds the greatest meaning of all. It's answered in Christianity alone. In Christian reality, dying for others is God's story in Jesus Christ. In the sacred activity of giving our all, Christ sustains eternal souls and those who look to him during earth's battles, great and small. But who is teaching these things? Bible-based, godly parents and grandparents who remember the lessons of the past are teaching these precepts. The schools no longer do it. The government no longer allows it. Hollywood decries it. The sellers of pleasure defame it. We only have the mammoth task of continuing to instill the honor of service and sacrifice into our youth. There's a a man that's not here today, one of our members uh, named Gene Ledford. I don't know how many of you all have had a chance to meet Gene, but he's homebound now because of his war injuries and because he's 94 years of age. But CJ and I visited him last week and um, we talked about his brother in World War II that was killed in action. And he showed us the Purple Heart, they sent the family for his death in action. And so, Gene, our Army First Sergeant, is remembered by us today, even though he can't be here. 
Our Lord said, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. So brothers and sisters, no matter our age or infirmity, it's incumbent upon us to join in this battle on the home front. I beg you to enlist. Enlist tomorrow. But today, as the poet has said, to fallen soldiers, let us sing. They where no rockets fly or bullets wing. Our broken brothers let us bring to the mansions of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have brought us to this day where we have the opportunity to honor those who have fallen, to honor those who have served, and to honor most of all the life that was given for us so that we would have eternal hope of glory and the model and example of giving our lives for others. We thank you for this time, this weekend, where we can celebrate this. And we pray that you will save our United States of America for the purpose that it has in this new century. In Jesus' name, amen.